Believers should be people who have a vision. There's a, a saying that the best use of one's life is that it is utilized in a manner and that a person does an action which the action outlives his own existence. After he's dead, the action outlives his existence. In the Islamic narrative, we call this a sadqatul jariyah. That you do an action, you've left this dunya, but you are still getting reward for that action, although you lie in the depth of your grave. And see, people have aspirations. Everybody has aspirations. The Prophet ﷺ once spoke about man's aspirations and he drew a box. And then he drew another line which started from outside the box and finished on the other side of the box, which came out of the box. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the first line, the long line, is man's life. The box is death. And the other lines which come out of the box are man's aspirations. Man dies, but he still has these aspirations. He had all these large, huge aspirations. But death befalls him, and he doesn't reach these aspirations. As a poet says, he said, if you go to the graveyard and you ask the people who lay in the grave, they will tell you about all the aspirations that they had, their desires that they had. If only Allah had given them more time, they had thought about what they're going to do tomorrow and the next week. And they had a huge vision for their business, for their career. But little did they know that before they would fulfill their aspiration, death would befall them. And this is my and your reality. That we have all these aspirations and the vast majority of our aspirations are actually dunyawi aspirations. So we're thinking about our career. We're thinking about our business. We're thinking about our houses, which area we live in and hopefully where we'll be living in 15 and 20 years. But there's another abode which we often forget, which as the Prophet ﷺ said, it is either a garden from the gardens of Jannah, or it is a pit from the pits of Jahannam. And that is our grave. And Luqman, the wise once said, he said, work in the dunya according to the time that you're going to live in it. And work for the hereafter according to the time that you're going to live in it. How long are me and you going to live in this dunya? But we dissipate our existence in the pursuit of this dunya and our eternal abode in which me and you will reside. How much do we work for that? And this is stupidity. Then I ask you, my dear respected brothers and sisters, the amount of time that we work for a temporary abode like the dunya compared to a permanent abode, the akhirah, then are we not stupid? Do we not have our priorities warped? And this is why it's very important for believers to have a vision. What is your vision? And as Sheikh Haytham said, that we have these aspirations and even if we don't attain these aspirations, Allah will reward us for our intention, if it's sincere, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ gave. He gave these people, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, he gave them a vision. He gave them an aspiration. And this is what the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they aspired for. Before Islam, you know the history of, of, the, of the Arabs before Islam. Two main superpowers never wanted to rule over that part of the Arab Peninsula, 
the Romans, the Byzantines and the Persians were not really interested in that part of the world. And then came to them the Prophet wasallam, and he gave them an aspiration. He gave them an impetus. He motivated them until these people became the best of creation after the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam to walk on the face of this earth. Why? Because he gave them a vision. And this is what we are lacking. We are lacking an Islamic vision. We are lacking an Islamic aspiration. He gave them aspiration which changed, it changed the world. On the battle of Khandak, this was also known as the battle of Ahzab, the battle of the confederates. All the enemies of Islam, they gathered and they marched on to Medina. And the Muslims were a fraction of their number. It was midwinter. Many of the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ had eaten for days. The Sahaba Allah came to the Messenger of Allah and they complained about hunger. And they removed their garment and they had a stone tied to their stomach. And the Prophet ﷺ removed his garment and he had two stones tied to his stomach. And then they, whilst they were digging the trenches, they came to a boulder. And they couldn't break this boulder. So they came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and he struck this boulder and a third of it broke and there was this huge spark and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Allah Akbar and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam struck it again and a third of it broke and there was a huge spark and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Allah Akbar and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam struck it the third time and it broke into pieces, small pieces and there was a spark in the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah Akbar. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked the Messenger of Allah, the spark, the Allah Akbar, what was it? And the Prophet ﷺ said, when I struck it the first time, Allah showed me that a day would come that the Muslims would take the palaces of Yemen. And when I struck it the second time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me that a day would come that we would take the Byzantine palaces of Sham. And when I struck it the third time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me that the day would come that we would take the white palace in Madain of the superpower of the day, the Persians. And this was a reality. And the Munafiqeen began to say, look at this man. He's promising them that they will become the superpower of the day and one of us is scared to go and relieve himself. But within a very short time, because the Messenger of Allah gave the Sahaba this aspiration, he gave them this vision. And in a very short time, in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu, the Muslims became the superpower of the day. Why? Because the people had an aspiration. They were motivated by this deen, they were motivated for the Akhirah. And this is why they made a change. They had a vision. And also with that vision, they had a scope. The problem is today, that you see the Muslim community, those who are motivated, their vision is this. What makes many youngsters and many even elders feel good, is that they will be speaking about issues of differences and this is the scope of their vision so they're still talking about you know should you be joining the feet in salah should you be placing your hands on your chest or or above your navels or below your navels 1400 years and you still haven't sorted out your salah but it makes you feel good doesn't it we can run down the other person and that's your scope and that's your vision and this is why this, that you're in the state that you're in. Because the reality is, that this is a reality. You know that you can't deal with the issues outside. Because you have no vision. And the Prophet ﷺ gave the Sahaba a vision that they became the superpower of the day. The Sahaba anhu didn't have huge masjids like this. The Masjid Nabi ﷺ was 30 by 35 meters. That's all it was. And after the battle of Khaybar, it was extended a bit more. That's all the size of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was. There was no fancy carpet on the floor. There was no AC. The ceilings barely exceeded the heads of those who prayed within it. 
There was no firm walls. They were made out of unbaked clay. But the people, the men and the women which emanated from the masajid, they were baked. They were motivated. Small masjid like the masjid of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam changed the landscape of half of the world. Why? Because people had a vision. People were motivated. You look at the, the Sahaba knew the virtue of Salah in Makkah and Medina. But how many of them died in Makkah and Medina? The vast majority of the Sahaba couldn't even read and write. But you, I ask you a question. Can any Sheikh today say that he knew Tafsir better than the Sahaba? Anhu? No, because they lived it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, those who make an effort in our path, we will show them the path. We, we, we will guide them to the path. But you got to have a vision. you got to be motivated. And all day, you know, we, we talk about Iraq. We talk about Afghanistan. We talk about Syria. We talk about Palestine. But what do we actually do for the movements? We want to revolutionize the world. But me and you, we can't wake up for the Fajr Salah. The help of Allah descends upon people's actions. But that motivation must start from yourself. What vision do you have for yourself? This is why as, as believers, talk now must be translated into a vision, into motivation, into aspirations. If you are spending you know, hours speaking about the issues of the Muslims globally, but you're doing nothing, then you're wasting your time. You'd rather read some Quran and do some dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because all you're doing is frustrating yourself. So we, are, we have a heritage, a heritage of Islam because you know, me and all of you are going to expire. So we might as well aspire before we expire. And Allah the Khalik, the Malik, the Raziq who brought us out into existence when we did not exist and we forget Allah. The only time we have for Allah is half an hour in Jummah. We have no time to teach our children. We're busy. We leave our children like the yatims. As Imam Shoki used, he said the yatim is not necessarily that person whose father is dead. He said the yatim is that person whose mother has forsaken her duties to a child. She's too busy. She's watching drama on TV. She's got no time for the child. She's on the phone. And the child is vegetating in front of the TV. Or the father is too busy. The father is aspiring, but he's aspiring for the dunya. And this is why, you know, we need people who have aspiration, but not just bold and raw aspirations, but people who have a scope. People who can assess the situation. Because we have many youngsters, they get themselves in trouble, and they get all the community in trouble. Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu was on the battlefield. And a man called Anush Jan, he was a Persian. He said, if Khalid is man enough to come and fight me, let him come and fight me. So Khalid radiallahu came forward to the battlefield. And Khalid radiallahu said to Anush Jan, he said, you're full of yourself, aren't you? And Anush Jan said, why shouldn't I be? I am the mightiest warrior amongst the Persians, the superpower of the day. And then Khalid radiallahu anhu said to him, then aren't mighty and brave men also meant to be intelligent? And he said, I'm known for my intelligence as well. Then Khalid radiallahu anhu said, if you're an intelligent man, then tell me, how do you worship fire? So Anush Jan said, listen, I haven't come here for a theological debate. So Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu said to him, it was an obligation for me to convey the message to you so that on the day of judgment, you don't say the message did not reach you. Now, 1400 years ago, Khalid bin Walid defined a man. And this is what the ulama called Rajulun Kamil. He must have or she must have two qualities. One, that they're brave. They're motivated. But not only that, if they just have that quality, and don't have any intelligence, then the ulama write that this is half a man. And the other one, he, he can assess the situation, he knows what's wrong, but he's not got any bottle to do anything about it. The ulama say he's a half a man as well. And they say, you know who's a rajulun kamil? A full man, a complete man, 
is he who has both of these qualities. That he's brave, he's motivated, but he can also, he's intelligence. He can assess the situation. And this is what we need. We need brothers and sisters who have a scope, who want to make a change, who are inspired for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who have some aspirations. Because believe it or not, all of us are going to leave this dunya. And the only thing that we are going to take from this dunya are our actions. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, do not forget your portion of this dunya. Let me ask you a question. Is your coffin going to have pockets? What are you going to take with you? The only thing that me and you are taking with us is our actions. And therefore it's important that we have high aspirations. And even if we don't reach those aspirations, we will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to leave something behind us that when we lie six feet under, under the ground, we are still getting reward for what we did because we had that aspiration. And that's what we want to be. And subhanAllah, there's so many of us. If just some people could get motivated. But that motivation must start from yourself. It's futile talking about changing the world when you can't change yourself. There was a story of a man who came home and he comes from work and he's tired. And his son wants to play with him, young son wants to play with him and he's tired and he wants to have some cup of tea, put his feet up. So what he does, he sees this paper and he sees a picture of the world on this paper. So he tears this paper up and he says, listen, put this world together Finish this and then I'll play with you. So he thinks that, you know, this is going to take the child quite a bit of time. The child comes back in a matter of minutes and he's put it all together. And he's shocked. And he says to the child, he says, how did you manage to do it so quickly? So the child says, he turns the paper the other way around. He said, daddy, on the other side there was a picture of a man. I put the man right and the world came right itself. You want to make a change? It starts from home. It starts from you. But it must be transitive. We are not people. I often say the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they were people who were made by the masjids. But they were not made for the masjids. Or not made only for the masjids. Today, me and you, the little that we are made, we are made by the masjids for only the masjids. Nobody outside the four walls of the masjid sees any good that we do. So we want to be people you know, who do an action which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll finish off on a, 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 a story. The Prophet sallallahu said that from the people before, there were three people who were going on a journey. And whilst they're going on this journey, it begins to rain. So they take shelter in a cave. And whilst they're taking shelter in a cave, a rock comes down and it covers the mouth of the cave. So they begin to push the rock, but the rock doesn't move. Then they decide, they're tired, they're exhausted, and they decide now to lie down, and you know, death befalls them. And then one of them stood up, and he said, Oh Allah, I had elderly parents, and what I would do every night before I would go to sleep, is that I would give my parents milk to drink. One day I went to look for fodder and I went further than I normally do and by the time I came back my elderly parents had gone to sleep. And my children were still awake, they were hungry but I didn't feel it befitting that I feed my children before I feed my parents. 
So I told my wife to put the children to sleep and she put them to sleep hungry. And I stood by the bed of my parents with the bowl. And when they woke up in the morning, I gave them the milk. He said, oh Allah, if you know that I done this action solely for your sake, then move the rock. And the rock moves a bit, but not enough for them to come out. And then the second man stands up. And he says, Oh Allah, I had a cousin and I was infatuated with this cousin of mine. There was no woman on the face of this earth that I loved more than this cousin. And I had made a move on her many times, but every time she turned me down. But one day she was in desperate need of money and she came to me. And I said on the condition that you allow me to have a relationship with you. And she agreed because she was in desperate need of the money. And he said just when I was about to have a relationship, she said to me, Ittaqillah. She said, fear Allah, fear Allah. Do not break the seal unless you are the rightful owner, meaning the husband. She said, when she said this, the fear of Allah permeated my heart and I moved back. And I gave her the money. And he said, oh Allah, if you know that I did this solely for your sake, then remove the rock. And the rock moved, but not enough for them to come out. And then the third person stood up. And he said, oh Allah, I hired a group of people and when it came to the end of the day, one of the people, he didn't collect his wages. So I invested his wages until there was a whole valley of cattle and livestock. That's how much it grew. And one day this man came to me and he said, I'm desperately in need of that day's wages. And I took him to the valley and I said, you see all this, this belongs to you. And he said, you're having a laugh. He said, I'm desperately in need, don't joke with me. He said, I invested that day's wages and this is how it mushroomed. All this is yours. And he said, oh Allah, if you know that I done this deed and this action solely for your sake, then remove the rock and the rock moved and all three of them came out. I ask yourself and I ask myself, if me and you were the fourth person in that cave, by what action that we've done in our life would we ask Allah to remove the rock? And if we haven't, then we need to aspire before our time is up. We need to make a change. We need to work within our communities. We need to get, make our Muslim um, our masajid vibrant. We need to become educated. We need to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our focus. Whatever we do, our businesses, as a community, we need to be united. We need to throw away these trivial issues. You know, these issues which divide us. And there are many things which unite us. And we need to become strong as a community. Motivated for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have a vision for yourself. And have a vision for your children. It doesn't necessarily mean that you change the world overnight. No. If, if every single person's home... You had an Islamic ethos in it. You brought up your children in a good manner. Children who feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we would have a strong community. So we, we endeavor and we aspire to do something. You know, when on the day of judgment, when we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that maybe just because of that action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to go into jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who aspire for his sake.
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our children people of piety. May Allah make us people of piety. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restore within this ummah the greatness that they once ha had. And may Allah keep us united in dunya and reunite us in jannah. For those of you, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.